and provided for our needs to worship him today. May we be strengthened by his word and through his spirit on Monday, December the 13th at 7.30 p.m. And there will be a council meeting DV on Wednesday, December the 15th at 7.30 p.m. This afternoon. Our call to worship this afternoon comes from Psalm 95, verse 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His land. Congregation, as we lift up our hearts to the Lord in worship, we confess. Our help is in the name of the Lord, Maker of heaven and earth. Our God greets us with His blessing. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. Amen. Let us respond to God's greeting by singing together Psalm 1, stanza 1. Let us call upon the Lord and ask for a blessing on this worship service. 
Merciful God, Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the opportunity you grant us this day to assemble together to worship you again this afternoon. While of ourselves, we would not want anything to do with you, condemning ourselves to an existence without you, and thus to eternal loneliness and death, you have reached out to us. You've come to us with your promises. You fulfilled your promises in sending the Son to become one of us and die for us. And you're changing hearts, our hearts, through the Holy Spirit. Righteous Lord, we acknowledge that there is much in our lives which is not right. This is evident when we read your law this morning. And sure, there's some good in our lives, but it is the fruit of the Spirit, fruit of your Spirit. It's your gift of grace. There is still so much which is not good. We confess our sins before your throne and ask, do not impute them to us, nor our sinful natures, but look upon us in your mercy. We plead on the sacrifice of Christ who paid the price for us. His blood flowed that ours would not have to. Forgive us all our sins and renew us by your spirit that more and more we will walk in the way everlasting. Gracious God, we pray you to be with those who are indifferent or even rebellious in their lives with you, those who could be here but refuse to be. Grant repentance for such as required. Lord, we pray, bless the proclamation of your word, that many may hear the truth and glorify you with us. Be with us now as we open scripture and as we continue to hear the gospel of praising you. Bless the reader so that he may speak forthrightly and sincerely. Help us to listen, to listen well, to absorb matters with the mind, and to take to heart what we hear, and so have your word instruct on us what to believe and how to live. Hear us, gracious Father, for we pray these things in the name of your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this afternoon comes from two passages. The first will be from Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 9, and then from Colossians 2. And following the scripture reading, let us sing together Psalm 1, stanzas 2 and 3. Starting with Proverbs 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. We will now move to Colossians 2 for our second reading. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, 
And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Thus far. Our text for this afternoon's sermon comes from Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10. Let us read that together again. Following the reading of the sermon, let us sing in response, hymn 23, sentences 1, 2, 5, and 6. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10. 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the, uh, to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Beloved in Christ, did you know that you have a worldview? You might be surprised by that. Me? A worldview? Isn't that something only for, for philosophers and deep thinkers? But think about this a bit more. Worldview seems like a fancy term, but it's quite simple. It's our way of looking at this world. It's how we understand things. A worldview describes how we all take a certain perspective on this life. It provides us with the way to deal with life surprises, even to make our plans for next year. It's kind of like the guiding of an internal GPS. It shows us the direction we like to go. It's for this reason that everyone in this world has a worldview. It might not be a healthy one, a proper one, or hopeful, but it's something that gives us direction. Your average person picks up ideas that he likes, here and there. You might read it in a best-selling book, or hear it in a pop song, or see it online. Ideas that seem to give life a unity and purpose, a way to chart our course. One person likes the idea of karma, that you better treat people right because what goes around comes around. Another says the most important thing is that you're happy. Even if we don't verbalize it, these ideas become the way we look at this world, and they shape the way that our choices are made. And a wrong worldview ends in disaster, because if this life is all about your personal happiness, then you've forgotten someone very important. Or if you've listened to a false god, that means you've rejected the true god. So what we need is a Christian view of life. We need a right way of thinking about the world. We need to have minds transformed, sanctified by God's wisdom. And this is what Paul promotes in his letter to the Colossians. I read God's word to you from Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10 on this theme. Paul warns us about the deadly deceit of human wisdom. First, the emptiness of philosophy. Second, the fullness of Christ. And third, our completeness in him. Again, Paul warns us about the deadly deceit of human wisdom. First, the emptiness of philosophy. Second, the fullness of Christ. And finally, our completeness in him. The emptiness of philosophy. We have a few teachers here among us. If we ask what was their greatest fear in teaching, the worst outcome they could imagine, they'd probably talk about their students forgetting. The whole point of education is giving lessons on all kinds of important subjects. So if the student finishes a year without being able to recall the basics of what's been taught, that's a serious failure for the student, and for the teacher as well. The Apostle Paul was a teacher. His life was dedicated to sharing God's revelation. He instructed many in the truth of Christ. He taught by his sermons, by his conversations, and by his letters. And Paul surely knew that terrible fear of his students forgetting. Also, when he writes this letter, his purpose is that the Colossians stand firm in what they've been taught. Look at chapter 1, verse 23. May you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. He wanted these believers to remember the lessons of faith. Paul's writing here to the church at Colossae. We don't read in Acts that Paul ever visited this town, but he did go to nearby Ephesus. It was in the same valley, just up the river. During Paul's time there, one of the new believers had been keen to share what he knew. So this fellow Epaphras had brought the gospel to the Colossians, and they received it greatly. Now it's some years later, and Paul's in, in jail somewhere, probably in Rome. But his own suffering didn't choke out Paul's love for the churches. Even from a distance, 
Paul wants to remind the Colossians of what they've been taught. Because if we hold on to anything, if we cherish anything, it needs to be the gospel of salvation. Paul's concern from chapter 1 comes back, even stronger in chapter 2, verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. In this verse, you can hear that forgetfulness isn't the only danger for students in the faith. So is deception. When you start listening to wrong ideas, buying into lies, believing the devil's propaganda. And in Colossae, false teachers were stirring things up. So he sounds the alarm. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Be on guard. Watch out that you don't make additions to the gospel or corrupt the truth that was delivered to the saints. Steer clear of philosophy. We may wonder if that's such a danger for us here in Calgary. We're straightforward people, aren't we? Maybe the Colossians like to read philosophy textbooks, but I think that very few of us do. So does this warning about philosophy in verse 8 ring a bit hollow? Don't we have bigger temptations to worry about than reading some Rousseau or looking at Aristotle on the internet? Do these things really threaten our faith in Christ? But as we said before, philosophy is much more than the subject you can study at university. Literally, it means love of wisdom. And in Paul's day, it was any theory about God, the world, and the meaning of human life. In his day, there were lots of philosophies in the market, lots of ideas going around. So it is today. A lot of people today also claim to love wisdom. But it could be a wisdom that's totally empty. It could be a worldview that contradicts the gospel. For we can't meditate ourselves to a happier life. Right thoughts don't make righteous people. That's why the Spirit says, Beware lest anybody cheat you, or better, lest anybody rob you. Deceptive ideas will always threaten to steal away God's truth. So what was the falsehood in Colossae? It seems to have been a real fruit salad of ideas. These people were taking a bit of that religion and a bit of this and storing it all up. It doesn't have to look pretty. It just, uh, just has to suit your taste. One thing on the Colossians' plate was a favorite treat of legalism, that God will save us because we behave ourselves and keep to some code of conduct. When you read chapter 2, you notice this legalism had a Jewish flavor because they were talking about circumcision and food laws and holy days. They wanted to regulate believers with rules about external things. Do not touch. Do not taste. Do not handle. If you lead a strict life, they said, then you're entitled to feel close to God. But as Paul puts it, these things are only the traditions of men. Making more rules and trying to keep them isn't the way to glorify God. He's not after the outward form, but God seeks the heart. There was something else as well. Legalism was joined with superstitions about angels and spiritual powers. Verse 8 describes the philosophy as being according to the basic principles of the world. The term basic principles is difficult to interpret, but it probably speaks of the spirit world, of angelic beings being both good and evil. On the streets of Colossae, there is a lot of speculation about these invisible powers and a real fear of what the bad spirits could do. Now we know that there is a spiritual realm, and please don't picture the wor spirit world as populated by those chubby little angels playing harps or by the little red men carrying pitchforks. But think of that whole host of angels and demons, servants of our Lord and servants of Satan. There is such a spiritual realm, and it is powerful. But the false teachers were obsessing over it. They thought that the spirits lived in the stars up in heaven, where they had the ability to control human lives. They imagined a whole chain of command between God and the world. So it was these angels who could protect you from Satan. Knowing the angels and pleasing them was how you could enjoy God's care. Hear the warning in chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility in worship in angels. Jewish legalism, worship of angels, and who knows what else. 
The Colossian heresy might have been a jumbled mix from the religious buffet, but it suited their taste. Thinking about it, we see it's not so different from today. People still want a way to think about the divine, about the world, and the meaning of human life. People still feel our People still desire to feel spiritual. Fewer people are in church, but more than ever, they want to talk about being connected to a higher power. People still stand at that smorgasbord of ideas, taking a bit from here and there. Consider the philosophies and worldviews we mentioned before. Some today still obsess over angels and demons and other spirits, to say nothing of wizards and magic and crystal balls. Or there's a constant focus on the environment. Preserving the planet becomes a lens through which everything else is looked at. Or these days, there's a new atheism, which is a worldview that denies God with religious zeal. For many others, for many of our neighbors, their worldview is all about self. Anything that feels good to me must be good. Self-expression is a way to fulfillment. God becomes made in the image of man. As Reformed people, we all have spiritual radars. And these radars are well-tuned, ready to detect any kind of bad theology. But you can be sure that our culture still affects us. For example, it's easy to start thinking of God in therapeutic terms. We've got this idea that God is focused on our happiness, that God's top priority is making us comfortable. Or we start to believe that God will surely love us just a little more if we behave ourselves or go to the right church. Or we start to question if there might be more than one path to, to salvation. After all, it's pretty intolerant to say that Jesus is the only way to God. These are more than just opinions that stay upstairs. They have an impact on us. For example, when you have a decision to make, it becomes very important for the way you look at yourself and at this world and at God. For when you look at yourself, do you consider that you're wise enough to make the right choice? Or when you think about God, do you really think that his honor is the most important thing all the time? Or is this life kind of about yourself as well? This is what Satan has been trying to do for thousands of years. Since the devil's work in paradise, he's always been selling his own brand of wisdom. He's always been telling us to worship at the altar of self. That if we listen to our hearts, we can become like God. But what does it get you? Worldly wisdom is only a well-packaged lie. Says Paul, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed rel self religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. They're of no value. And finally, they rob you of salvation itself. So, beloved, don't forget what you've learned. Don't be embarrassed about the truth of God's word. Don't give in to the thinking of our culture because it sounds more appealing or seems more acceptable. But embrace what is already yours in Christ. Now for our second point, the fullness of Christ. If you had to fight against a false teaching, how would you do it? You might try this or that tactic, but soon you just state the truth in a straightforward way. The church has often done this, being forced to confess what she believes. As someone once wrote, heretics have been responsible for so much good doctrine. So when Paul describes his philosophy, he first dismisses it as being according to the traditions of men. He rejects it for being according to the basic principles of the world. But then about the worst thing he can say comes last. In verse 8, this empty worldview is not according to Christ. That says so much about why human thinking is empty. It's not according to Christ. Because our way of looking at God, the world, and the meaning of life needs to be shaped by Christ and by Christ alone. It's in Christ that all things hold together. Chapter 1, verse 17. Next to Christ, every philosophy is futile. Next to Christ, every rule misses the point. Only in him are we redeemed and remade for God's glory. Paul wants to explain that. 
He wants to show the one alternative to all those self-help schemes, all that false religion, and the obsession with our own happiness. So he sets before us the truth. Jesus Christ, the one who is superior to all and everything in the created realm. Paul started talking about the supremacy of Jesus Christ already in chapter 1. Maybe you can read Colossians 1 at dinner today, where praise for a Savior is piled up. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Christ is the creator of the universe. Christ is the sustainer of all things. Christ is the head of the church and the firstborn of the dead. That's echoed in chapter 2, verse 9. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That part of our text can sound like a pretty dense statement. But it's saying that God himself is revealed in Christ. Not in the same way that God showed himself, for instance, at the burning bush. No. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Everything that God is, all that he can do, God's perfect will and wisdom are all wrapped up in the person of Christ. So when we see Christ, we see God. What this means is that all we can know about God, all that we need to know about him, God has already told us in Christ. There's no need for us to speculate. There's no need to hunt for a higher truth in God's word or chase a mystical experience. True religion is found in a living fellowship with Christ. If you really want to be spiritual, if you want to have God inside of you, wherever you are, then you have to know Christ. He's our one and only connection to the divine. Notice how the Spirit slips in that word bodily, that God dwells in Jesus in his body. A lot of philosophers back in Paul's day said the body is evil. It's a dispensable carton for the precious soul inside. The body is kind of like those plastic containers we'll toss in the bin when the food is gone. The body was dispo disposable, while the soul is immortal. It was scandalous then that God would ever take on human form. But God is in Christ as a man, because God wants to redeem us fully in body and soul. The point is that we don't need to be touched by an angel, or follow some guru, or find another savior, not when we have Christ, not when we believe in him. And if people are still obsessed with angels and spirits, and wizards and witches, they need to know that Christ is actually in charge of them at all. In charge of them all. Verse 10 says he is ahead of all principality and power. Terms that again describe the realm of spirits. By coming to earth, Jesus put Satan in chains so that the demonic realm has no more power over us. As we read in chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. There is no need to live in fear of demons or even the devil himself, not when our Christ is our Lord and Master. So what about those rules that the Colossians loved? Do not touch, do not taste. Today we still like rules. Be a good person. Go to church. Don't swear and so on. But thinking about the Christian life only in terms of rules is dangerous. Because it has a terrible side effect. It makes Christ unnecessary. Who needs Christ if we can pull ourselves out of the muck of sin by our own effort? Who needs Jesus if you can be a good person by ticking a few boxes. This is the alternative. If you're looking for true understanding of God, let it be according to Christ. If you're seeking real wisdom, let it be according to Christ. If you want a vision of life that really works, look no further than to your Savior. For in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ is a key to everything we need. If we begin with Christ, we can never go wrong. Because at the cross, Jesus already dealt with our biggest problem. Our biggest problem in this life isn't terrorism or disease. It isn't social oppression or lack of education. Our biggest problem isn't poor self-image or unhealthy relationships. Our biggest problem is sin. The offense that separates us from the God or Creator. That sin will kill you if it's not dealt with. But when you have faith in Christ, your sin is fully forgiven. And the power of evil is already conquered. For our final point, our completeness in him. 
You could divide most of Paul's letters into two parts. There's a doctrinal, and then there's a practical. So for Colossians, when we get to chapters 3 and 4, Paul says, now that you've seen how great Christ is, seek him with your whole life. But already now he wants to bring it home. When in verse 10, he states, you are complete in him. That's the present reality and very practical. We have all that we need in Christ. Through his work, we're given a new holiness. In him, we have access to God. We can enter the presence of his glory and receive his strength and grace. We're even being remodeled in the image of God. We are complete in him. A consequence is that we don't need to look for completeness elsewhere. Don't let your sense of worth get shaped by what position you've achieved in this world, how much attention you're getting, and how productive you're being. That's not completeness. Because in Christ, we have all that we need. The fullness of God's Son can fill your emptiness to overflowing. And we're learning how Christ gives us the right perspective. Christ shapes our worldview when we wake up in the morning and we think about what kind of day we're going to have. His gospel molds us when we're eager that day to do what pleases God. It shapes us when our relationship with God is the most important thing to us. We can tie this to that piece from Proverbs 2, all about God's wisdom. There, Solomon is talking to his son about the appeal of true wisdom. It's something to search for like treasure, something to cry out for like water, something to store up within you forever. This wisdom is not to be found in the theories of men or the findings of science. It's not to be found within us either, in the emotions of the heart, the imaginings of the mind, or the pleasures of the body. But real wisdom begins with knowing and serving God. Says Solomon, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 2, verses 5 and 6. If you want to find your path for life, it's simple. You have to look at things in God's way. What are you here for? And what's your calling? How can you worship your Savior? What should you do with the gifts that he's given you? Everything gets colored by that, by who we become in him. While many people these days are bewildered and confused, we know that everything is in its God-given place. We're right where we need to be, in God's purpose and for, and for God's praise. When you confess Jesus as Lord, then you'll see the truth of it, that all things do hold together in him. When you're led by the Holy Spirit, you'll understand that you're here for his glory and not your own. In the beginning, that's what we were made for. And at the cross, that's what we were saved for, for his higher glory. Christ is already the Lord of the universe and everything that fills it. Now he needs to be served as Lord of the church and the Lord of your life. Amen.
Let us bow our heads in thanksgiving and prayer. Almighty King, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel we could hear this afternoon. We thank you for being a God who looks out for his own, especially when the going is tough. Thank you for sending us your Son to grant us access to and lead us into your kingdom of perfection. We long for the day your dwelling will be with us. May that day be soon. In the meantime, keep us close to yourself in faith, in hope, and love. Gracious God, we pray for your nearness in our lives. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for things that are going well, for birthdays and anniversaries that we may celebrate. We thank you for the jobs, houses, and vacations that we may have. You bless us with life filled with many possibilities, and we live in a society where things are relatively safe and there is much prosperity. Thank you. We wish to express our gratitude for all these things with our gifts. Lord, we pray for those who have special needs in our midst, those struggling with illnesses and physical limitations. Bless treatments that are being undergone and grant health and strength so that life may be enjoyed. Lord, be also with those who experience challenges in life that are lasting. May they all find security in your goodness and greatness as they battle or see a loved one battle illness. Lord, encourage those who feel the grave is looming around the corner. May they be comforted by the knowledge of your grace in Christ. May we all, whatever you and your wisdom give us in life, experience your nearness in order that we may be loyal and loving in our thoughts and actions, and so that your name is praised because of us. Lord, be with those who have special responsibilities, as spouses, as parents, as office bearers, as governing authorities, as employers, as mentors and supervisors, as people with responsibilities in regard to others. Grant wisdom and sensitivity for the tasks at hand. Help us in all of life to reflect who you are, a righteous and forgiving God who goes to great lengths to make things good and right. Bless us as a congregation, as brothers and sisters in the faith, have us realize in a very practical and real way how good we have it. May our communion of saints be a close-knit one. Help us look out for those who run the risk of falling by the wayside. Lord, be with our young people as they take on responsibilities and try to figure things out for themselves. May they be receptive to instruction and may their enthusiasm fire others on who are tiring in the battles of life. Merciful Lord, accept our thanks and hear our petitions. We lay them before you, recognizing that you alone rule over all. The kingdom is yours and the power is yours, and you alone are worthy of such petitions. The glory and honor is yours now and forever. Amen. The sermon that was read this afternoon was prepared by Reverend Reuben Bradenhoff, the minister of the Free From Church at Mount Nasira in Western Australia. The collection this afternoon, again, will be for Mission Aviation Fellowship. You will have the opportunity to provide for today's collection as you exit the auditorium. We will now profess our faith with the Church of all times and places with the singing of the Apostles' Creed as set to music in hymn one. And then following our singing of the Apostles' Creed, we will remain standing to sing our closing song, our closing hymn, 37, stanzas one and two.
The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.